Time is an illusion. Lunchtime, doubly so. There you have it, folks. Chad smokes crack. Fuck yes. Yeah, smack that bitch up. No. no. I was smoking crack, and it's perfectly fine. Yeah. <sighs> Smacking you right in the face. You have Sam Rock. Death work. and easily the dumbest thing I've ever said on the show. Bill Clinton meets Elvis. I love how you get so bored of your own show that you leave. Good thing I know where my towel was, because I just spilled my pangalactic gargle blaster all over the place. Broadcasting live from inside the power band, this is The Blah. In this episode, everybody dies via not having their towel. I'm your host, Wolverine, along with my fellow hitchhikers, Jar Higo. Hey. And C-Lab forever. What's up, you hoopy fruit? There you go. That's right. Don't panic, folks. We're going to be talking about a very special movie today, and that would be the eponymous classic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. New vocab, Mulvey. Nice. Nice. Yes. Let's dive in. Nice. A, a, a new adjective. I know. I was. It just came to me. In a fever dream. Happy Towel Day, guys. There you go. Happy Towel Day to everybody. Yes. Happy Towel Day. Where do we start with this uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film? I think, uh, Benny, you should uh, consider laying out your argument that you that you said to us in the past about this movie in comparison to the other materials. Because we're going to be arguing in favor of something in this show, I believe. Uh, do we really want to just smack it in the face like that? Fuck yes, yeah, smack that bitch up. I don't think there's an. I don't actually. I don't want this episode to be a but the comparison between the movie and the books. No, no, it doesn't need to be. But having listened to the audio book, it's very, 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 very similar. Like there isn't very much difference, really. So you, it's almost not even worth getting into the book versus the movies. But it was interesting when you mentioned to me, you know, the general hatred for the movie and how you thought it was misplaced. And I, I definitely tend to agree having revisited the stuff. Yeah, it is true. I have uh, in conversation with various fellow nerds encountered a lot of resistance to this movie. What? And really? I just, yeah, I just don't agree. I much prefer the original BBC TV series. Yes. The radio drama or whatever. That's what I get. No, there was actually a BBC TV series. Oh. Early 80s or late 70s. I'm not sure which. Uh, you know, like, you know, Doctor Who, uh, practical effects. Yeah, right. You know, wonderfulness. No, I, I kind of was one of those people that when I first saw this movie, wasn't really stoked with it and was kind of like, what the fuck? It's not, it's not as good as the books. And then didn't watch it until you recently mentioned that. I was like, oh, I'll check it out again. And watching it, I was like, this is great. So I don't know what kind of moody bullshit I was chomping on that day. But mm, yeah, well, look, I mean, there there are, you know, the, the differences are kind of, uh, you know, I think the movie glosses over a lot of detail. Um, and I think that's a major objection that people have. And, you know, it's got some omissions and it's got some additions. But that being said, this was Douglas Adams screenplay. Yeah. You know what I mean? He he had basically finished it. They they had to touch a couple of things up, but it wasn't any of the major plot points. Everything in there that was changed was Douglas Adams. And, you know, he he really wanted this movie to be made. And I'm glad it got made. So. You know, again, I will always say appreciate the movie for what it is versus the other source material because there's there's always going to be some differences. And I think if you get hung up on that shit, then you might be missing something that would otherwise be very enjoyable. Mm, yeah. And I think I did get hung up on it back in the day. And I'm glad that you pushed me to revisit it because I was smoking crack and it's perfectly fine and quite enjoyable. There you have it, folks. Chad smokes crack. Yeah. Just, you know, this... I learned it from you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> the whole Hitchhiker series, you know, got to start as a radio play. Yeah. And then it was adapted to a book, and then it was adapted to the TV series. And then, you know, so it's gone through a lot of incarnations and changes over the years, and they've all been a little bit different. And, you know, and that's great. It's uh, it's, a pro it's appropriate for the series, I think. You know, it's like uh, somebody fires up the improbability drive and a different version pops out on the other side. <laughs> so Totally. You know, anyways, hopefully that solves everything and uh, we can just move forward from there and not worry about too many comparisons to the books or the TV series or whatever. No, I definitely I, I had no intention of doing that, Ben. Um, as you 
probably guessed. I, I just thought it was interesting because I don't know a ton about this particular property. So I was interested to see that it did start as a radio play because that's something that I do. And then he adapted it into the book from the radio play. I thought that was very interesting. And then also that it, you know, it became a cheesy TV series in the eighties and, and all that good stuff. But, you know, the only comment I really have to that is that, you know, people need to take it easy, man. I mean, my God, when the original writer writes the script, it's like, it doesn't get any better than that in terms of a blessing for it to be done. So, yeah, I mean, whether you like it or whether you don't, you can't say it's not like you can't say it's not real, you know, or you can't say that. Exactly. It's like, you know, it's if it's been butchered by anybody, it's been butchered by the author. So, right. You know? So you can get pissed at him. Exactly. exactly if, yeah. it, if it had been written by somebody else, then I could see some valid complaining. But, you know, it hasn't. Indeed. And just to be clear, I love the books. Yeah. I, yeah. I It's some of my favorite stuff out there. So. Mm. And just so everybody's aware, you've read the books. Chad, you, have you read the books? I've read at least three of the five in the trilogy, the five-part trilogy. I think I may be even four out of the five. Right on. I have read none of the books, seen none of the TV series, listened to none of the radio plays. Uh, the only thing I did was watch this movie many times in the past and then again last night. And then I also watched um, a Thug Notes review of – this movie five minutes before the show started, courtesy of Jarhigo. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny that we ended up in the space of uh, if the movie sucked, it's because the original writer sucked at it or whatever, which isn't the case. But I think it's kind of funny because I learned that the sixth book, the last book in the series, was written by one of Douglas Adams' friends after he died. So in a way, like, yeah, one of the last pieces of canon in the in the stuff was actually not even written by Douglas Adams, which is kind of like an interesting spin on that on that idea. Mm. Okay, well, just like an early an early nugget for y'all. Interesting. What what book is that? Oh, I don't even remember. I don't think I've read that. Yeah, me neither. The last book I read was mostly harmless, and that was indeed written by. Oh, it's called it's called and another thing. Yeah, that's it. Huh. Well, I have something. I have something to check out. In the universe, yeah. Um, as far as the movie goes, one thing that I was really like reminded of is just how fantastic the cast is in this. Mm. Yeah, the cast is uh, its one of two things, I think, that really prop this movie up. Mm. Um, the other perhaps being the the practical effects and all of uh, you know those awesome Henson creatures. Mm. Yeah, the creatures were awesome too, for sure. Just or you know, I don't know if they prop it up, but they're two things that have always stuck out to me about the movie that are awesome. Yeah, I didn't realize they were Henson creatures. I'm sure it was in the credits, but that's awesome. Yes, sir. I think Henson's a great fit for uh, for Adams's world. It just nothing against like an ILM or a a Weta Workshop or whatever, but I feel like. Henson stuff is a perfect fit. It's like somewhat of the era and has a similar flavoring. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I think uh, your ultimate Vogon is eventually is, is has to come out of the uh, the Henson workshop. It has to, right? Yeah, yeah. I well, seeing how they did come out, and I, I can't imagine them any other way because they're <laughs> so great. Yeah, I don't know if that's how I pictured them in the books per se, but I can't really picture them any other way. Like I, I watched the uh, the BBC TV series fairly recently, and I was like, "Oh, those those Vogue, I don't think those Vogons are as good." What are what did they do? They just look like people. I hope not. Uh, they were uh, sort of a bright green color with uh, like red eyebrows and and facial hair, and they were green. And yeah, they kind of looked like people, but they're like people with like a lot of facial prosthetics on. Interesting. <laughs> those kind of cheesy practical effects that are you know maybe so bad they're good or you know like they're not great but there's a charm to them that came from that era that that's you know really lovable in some way so i mean they're cool but i don't think they're they're nowhere they're apples and oranges are two different things you know totally are they are they like the um the sort of star trek series of various series of the 90s where it was like uh let's just <laughs> take another human and put a bunch of shit all over their face and call it a new race something like that and then you get, you know, keeping up with the Cardassians. Hey, <laughs> it still needs to be made into a show. I'd watch it. <laughs> you know. So I only actually ended up with one note for the entire movie, which was the sighing doors. I absolutely cracked up when I heard the sighing doors. 
<sighs> There's so much good stuff in this, but I just, the sign doors, man, it killed me. I literally, I died. Yeah, sign doors are great. You know, without going into a ton of detail, they did some nice little hat hat nods to some details in the books that, you know, and that is one of them, you know, the sign doors. Being being that this is your first exposure to the universe, Kev, what was, do you recall kind of first impressions of the silliness? Because it's so silly. Well, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, it was, I mean, everybody, you know, when the movie came out, everybody's like, oh my God, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, you know, and, and Ben too, you know, who probably recommended it to me. I didn't see it in the theater, but I watched it and I just thought it was a delightful, absurdist romp, you know? I mean, that's pr- pretty much what it is. I, I thought it was fantastic. I had never seen, I think it was certainly a, one of the first big, like, um, Martin Freeman things that exposed him to the greater universe, you know, like, uh, that he did. And I, I just thought he was great. I just thought everybody was great in the movie. I, I loved the story. It was just super weird and funny. You know, was, I've seen it many times, many, many times. And I, you know, there's certain things that stick out at me that I absolutely love about this movie. And, and that's it. I don't, I don't really give, or like I said in the beginning, I dig that like there's books and a radio play, a radio play especially intrigues me, but you know, I don't really give a shit about all that. I think the movie's fantastic. Yeah. I suppose thinking, thinking about it now, just kind of from like an analyzing it point of view, it, it kind of somewhat fits with like Mel Brooks's kind of stuff. I mean, obviously it was written back in the day, but it, it aligns with like a blazing saddles or space balls or any of that kind of stuff. It's super silly. But it's, I don't know, it's its a different kind of silly, though. I think that's what attracted me to it originally. Yeah, it's British silly, so it's, you know... Br- yeah, that's fair. It's British humor. Python-esque. Yeah, I would say, you know, you kind of take, like, this and Python and, and and stuff like that, the Mighty Boosh even, maybe, and, you know, that's the British equivalent of the Mel Brooks stuff, or vice versa, however you want to say it. Mm. Is, is Doctor Who have silly bits not obviously to the same degree but i've never really been much of a who person doctor who person you're pretty big into that benny aren't you um it yeah I, well i mean I've, I've watched a lot of it i've even watched a bunch of the new stuff and some of it's great um i was definitely a huge fan of like the tom baker era totally that was like you know i don't know that was that was in heavy rotation on pbs and <clears throat> My dad really liked him as a doctor, so we would kind of watch those. It was on at like just like right after dinner or whatever, so we would always watch Doctor Who. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's yeah, there are some similarities, I guess, um, and there definitely is some silliness in Doctor Who. And there's I don't know, I mean, there are some very absurd con- concepts in Doctor Who. Not that I want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but you know, just the idea of the TARDIS being like, you know, this fucking crazy uh interdimensional time traveling spaceship that you know the the part that protrudes into our dimension is a, looks like a police box <laughs> and you walk inside of it and it's gigantic in there you know so you know i think that's kind of uh similar kind of dna and concepts and ideas as Hit- hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy yeah yeah i have to i have to check out doctor who at some point but i mean it's just like so huge that i've just stayed away from it yeah, sometimes when things are too big, you're just scared of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was like Ben. I watched the – my brother and I watched the Tom Baker Who's, and uh, I, I could never wrap my mind around the whole idea of the police box being like a, a massive on the inside, small on the outside, you know, kind of thing. I don't know. My brother and I used to just run around saying, exterminate, 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 exterminate. <laughs> Good little darlings you were. I think um, some of the some of the ways that they – like you were saying, Ben, with the the doors being sprinkled in, some of the book lore being sprinkled in, I feel like they also had some clever ways that they dealt with some of the sillier book stuff, like um, Beeble Brox's two heads and three arms, you know? Like, that would have been pretty tough to do, side-by-side heads or whatever, and I kind of like some of the creative ways they solved those problems. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that one up, because that's one of the things that people always fucking complain about, is that, well, he doesn't have two heads, you know? The same people are the same ones that'll be like, I fucking hate CGI. Yeah. yeah. I want practical effects. And how are you going to do a second head, you know, like a like a really convincing second head without... I mean, they did a prosthetic head in the BBC TV series, and it's 
you know, it's kind of like half asleep and, you know, they try to explain it away that way. And it's kind of funny and it's got a, you know, cheesy, goofy charm to it. But in a big production like this, you got to find a practical way to deal with the situation. And I thought that the head popping up from his neck was a, it added like a really funny comedic, you know, angle to the whole problem. And it was perfect. You know, I mean, it was practical. It, it, it worked. Didn't have to be going around with, you know, two heads. And the fact that they sort of dis- his his third arm was like always disguised and it would kind of just creep out and do things occasionally. It would just fly up. Yeah. I thought that was cool, too. So I I liked all of those little adaptations. I didn't think they were a problem, you know. Yeah, they weren't they weren't exactly what it says in the book. But, you know. Well, I mean, look, you, you're going to write a book in the 70s, man. And then, I, I mean, really, honestly, the idea of a prosthetic head side by side that's half asleep and a pop-up head that comes from underneath, it's like the same thing, man. I mean, you're there are no two-headed people, okay? So when things go into TV and movies, the creators have to come up with creative ideas to get around that. It's as simple as that, man. I don't understand. God, people are just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. How could you possibly complain about that? It's so stupid. I mean, I get it. And they could have, they probably could have done, you know, a, a miraculous CGI second, you know, head for Zaphod. And it probably would have been fine. But, you know, I mean, I don't know, in 2005, maybe they couldn't have. But, um, you know, if they wanted to do it now, they could. I think at the time, the solution was clever. And it, it actually added to the comedy. You know, it made it funnier, I thought. The whole, like, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> sound like you know the the like you know making it embody all the worst characteristics of Zaphod. like i thought that was great yeah and also the way that like when his main head would come back down he'd be like wait what 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 happened what, what, what what's going on you know what i mean like he didn't know what the other head was doing mm-hmm. i like that yeah mm. and I, I especially liked the um ridiculous scarf that was meant to kind of camouflage the situation a bit like it was so in keeping with something dumb that he would come up with himself yeah it's just yeah i I thought it was super well handled yeah it was it was perfectly fine you know um and good god i mean like smacking you right in the face you have sam rockwell oh come on it's so good i mean you know neck head whatever sam rockwell was amazing like just pulling off this kind of like i don't know Bill Clinton meets Elvis <laughs> meets George Bush kind of, you know, personality like Oh my god, dude, he's fucking amazing. Did you did you guys see Three Billboards? Oh, that's so funny. That's, it's so good, man. Sam Rockwell, like that was the movie where people like the greater sort of world kind of was like, wow, this guy's amazing, but we knew he was amazing a long time ago. I mean, my God, man, every single thing he's done, like Moon, was amazing. Dude, Moon is so good. Yeah, we'll link that up. Um, any one of these movies out that we're going to say right now, you, everybody should go watch if you haven't watched them already. Moon, Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Uh, I think he won an Academy Award for that, or he was nominated at the very least. Uh, let's not forget Galaxy Quest. Sorry, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. There it is. <laughs> Guy. I mean, he plays Guy. How, plays guy. how awesome. He plays the perfect, like, uh, actor who had a shitty part who goes to every single convention <laughs> in the hopes that he's going to get something more in the future. And he does. He finally gets a name. It's great. And he plays it brilliantly, just like he does in this. He was fantastically cast as Beeble Brox. I mean, those are some tough. All of the characters are very difficult to fill, you know? Like, uh, Yasin Bey as Ford Prefect is just so good. Um, most deaf. Yeah, most deaf was amazing. I thought he brought a lot to uh to Ford Prefect for sure. Mm. Sorry, Chad. What did you say first? Yasin Bey. That's his new name. He just changed his name. I think he converted to Islam. Oh, he changed his name. Got it. I'm pretty sure he converted to Islam. But yeah, I di- I didn't catch that. I didn't catch that news item. Sorry. That's all good. Yeah, no, most deaf man. Wow. He was great. I had no idea who he was when I first saw this either. So I, I thought he was fantastic. And then to find out that he's a musician rather really more than a actor, I was like, hmm, man, he really brought it. His uh, his music is amazing, too. I, I love his stuff. Yeah, he uh, he definitely he brought like a really great awkwardness to the character and really fleshed that as, you know, like. 
the whole idea of Ford Prefect showing up on, you know, the idea is Ford Prefect shows up on Earth thinking that cars are the predominant life form. And he picks the name <laughs> Ford Prefect because he, think it's, he thinks it's going to be inconspicuous and he can blend in. So, you know, and that's another great thing. One of the little things that they just kind of glanced in but but gave it a little, like, background lore in the movie. Like, just a quick scene is, you know, him, like, holding up, a, you know, holding flowers and waving to a car as it's about to fucking hit him. And then Arthur, like pushing him out of the way and that's how they become friends like i thought that was a great way to show that he thought cars were the predominant life form you know <laughs> and it's like the perfect tourist analogy too it's just so great yeah yeah but i mean the book describes him as like you know sort of uh, not ever quite fitting in correctly you know and, and i think he did like a great job of like bringing that kind of awkwardness to to things you know yeah mm -hmm. i kind of missed i missed it if it was mentioned in the movie but i had forgotten that he was kind of like a, a traveling reporter for the Hitchhiker's Guide. Yes. They didn't mention that in the movie. They did not, or they did? I, as far as I, I know, they didn't, because I watched it last night, and then I did a bit of reading, and that's when I, I when I was reading is when I found out that he was like an editor for the the guide. Yeah. Yeah, so I couldn't recall if it was in the movie or not, but I, I, I had forgotten that that was a thing. Kind of like the Lonely Planet dudes, people used to go around and uh, contribute or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can't remember a thought maybe it was mentioned in like you know uh another great cast member uh who you don't ever see but is in the movie a bunch uh stephen fry as the hitchhiker's guide right right i thought maybe in one of those little sequences they might have mentioned that that he worked for the hitchhiker's guide but i don't recall now speaking of which i thought that the the way that they handled kind of exposition and like describing what you were seeing via the guide really well handled and you know the interspersing of kind of the graphics and stuff like it's so hard to translate this book because or the whatever material because it was just it's so all over the place you know and it's so much of it is it like cul-de-sacs of encyclopedia entries like how do you make a film about it and it was it was quite well handled considering how challenging it would be and i i would get i would guess that a lot of the like entries where they went on little side jams in the book probably didn't make it into the movie. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a fair bit that's missing. I mean, it's mostly, like you said, Benny, it's mostly detail as opposed to major plot points to my recollection. Yeah. There's a lot. I mean, but there's a lot of funny detail in the book. Yeah. And I think that's one of the yeah. problems people have with the movie is that it skips a lot of that stuff or, it, you know, in a, in a sort of like, quickly glancing hat tipping way will have like a quick scene that sort of illustrates something. Mm. One of those little funny concepts from the book that didn't really get fully explained, you know, but I understand why they did that. Otherwise you would be stopping like every 30 seconds for the hitchhiker's guide to interject with like an explanation of everything. Yeah. Right. You know, right. You know what I mean? Right. It would have been hell for pacing. So there's like the scene with the whale falling in his entire life, you know, that's a notable mm -hmm you know, nugget from the book. So it wasn't that they weren't being true to the nuggets. It was just that, like, you couldn't do them all because you just didn't have the runtime. So, you know, the argument of, like, oh, that's missing so much stuff, it's like it's it's not necessarily missing everything because it doesn't care about everything. It just didn't have seven hours to do it in, you know, and like you said, pacing. But Right, yeah. Well, you know, it's they skipped that detail and they had the audacity to add the uh, Hamakavula or, you know, the point of view gun or, you know, right. things like that. It's like, well, they took the time with that, but they didn't take the time with this other thing. And I get it, man. But also Hamakavula. Come on. Dude, it was, it was great, man. John Malkovich was so perfect. Malkovich? 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 Um, Malkovich? <laughs> we got to do yeah, that one. John someday. Malkovich. Come on. Oh, definitely. What what is that, being John Malkovich? Yeah. yeah. You know, this property probably would have, if it was done now, like if they came to the table with this now, I think he would have gone to like Hulu, Netflix, Prime to try to make it into a series. Because clearly that would have solved everybody's problem with this. You could have put in virtually everything into it, all of the entries from the guide and all of that stuff, you know. We've talked about this already many times on this show, and I think that probably should have been a series. When you know, maybe not back then, but now it could have been a series because now they're throwing more larger money at series. You know what I mean? And it could have solved that problem. But but being being that what it is, um, again, you gotta you gotta make choices and decisions to keep the story moving along. So it's like 
too bad, so sad. You got to pick the major plot points, man. Yeah, and it, like I've I listened to the audio book in the over the last two days, so it's very very fresh, and there aren't really major major things missing from the film, really. Like you said, the two things you said, Ben, are the two glaring differences. You know, the point of view gun in particular, but like the results yeah. are the same, you know, like the ending of the oh, of the, the book and the Arthur Trillian romance. Yeah, but the Arthur Trillian thing, it, I remembered similarly that it wasn't in the book until, you know, it is quite strongly insinuated in terms of like she was the person that he hit on at the party and Zaphod swept in and stole the stole the day, you know, so the Hollywood smooch at the end, you know, whatever. Right. But I think in the book, he's not, I think in the book, he's not like hung up on her. He just kind of, yeah, you know, you're not going to get a movie made without a love story, like pretty much end of story. <laughs> at least back then you weren't. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it didn't surprise me. And it seemed like the logical choice to, mm. to introduce that aspect. Um, also, that, that, that reminds me of something. I, th- I feel like, you know, despite the romance being an additional thing that wasn't in the book, I feel like the characters of Arthur and Trillian were way better fleshed out in the movie. Like, mm. they had more depth, you know? Um, Certainly Trillian. Yeah, definitely Trillian. And, you know, I feel like Arthur was just always whinging about tea in the book, you know? And he was just this kind of like, he just didn't seem to have like a lot of, I mean, it, in the later books, he evolves, but you know, through much of like the first book and the second book, Arthur's just kind of, you know, he's constantly confused. He's constantly crying and whinging about stuff. And he's not really very like, I don't know. He just never struck me as being particularly believable. And I feel like, I feel like he has a little more depth in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely agree with that. Whinging about tea like that. Yeah. Which he does in the movie. Yeah. But it's, it's a little more like exaggerated in the books, I think. <laughs> uh, one one of the things that I I really enjoyed, uh, I, don't, I don't know why this always stuck out at me, is the bartender at the <laughs> bar before that the Earth gets destroyed. That guy just I, I don't know what it was. He just really cracks me up. He handles it well. Well, he does, and, the, and just the way he says, "Should we put put a paper bag over our heads or something?" All yeah, right, yeah, we'll make you feel better great. if you like. <laughs> Will I help? No. I love how we're like, we don't want to talk about the book and it's pretty much doing. everything that we're, <laughs> it's all we're doing. God damn it. I was just going to say that exact thing. Uh, and you beat me to the punch. Well, that's kind of why I said closing statement. I think we can move beyond that. Yeah. We we brought up the cast and we've touched on it, but we you sort you of brought it up, Chad, and then we didn't really ever talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we blasted through it. Some of the like nostalgia stuff I really enjoyed about the cast was like Warwick Davis as Marvin, which I really appreciated, even though he obviously didn't speak. Mm, yeah, I love the fact that it's Warwick Davis in in the costume. Um, so you know, a tip of the fedora to Warwick. I, I love that guy. Willow is such a classic movie. You know, Warwick Warwick the Ewok. He's a legend. He is. No, oh, he's definitely a legend, dude. He played a many, many Star Wars characters. And yes, Willow that came up on my, uh, I, I don't know, I was banging around looking for this movie the other day. Willow popped up and I was like, oh, man. I need to revisit that one, too. Yes, we do. And then that uh, that transitions into Alan Rickman, which is like the best possible voicing of Marvin. I absolutely loved Alan Rickman in this. And may he rest yeah. in peace. Yeah. Yeah. R.I.P., man. What a great actor. How are you going to do better than that? Yeah, you're not. Come on. But he's just so perfect. He has that whingy voice kind of already. I think touching on what you said a second ago, Benny, Trillian was very, very flat and non-eventful as a character in the in the book, but Zoe Deschanel really brought her to life as well as, you know, the writing and stuff. So she was she's great. And she was so like, you know, Zoolander style, that's Hansel, he's so hot right now. Like she was like the it girl in two thousand and five, two thousand six or whatever, around that time. So it was perfectly cast. Yes, she was. <laughs> she was the it girl. Yeah, she was. Yeah, she's terrific. I have never known how to pronounce this guy's name. Bill Nye. Thank you. <laughs> Done. He's always good for, uh, you know, some good laughs and some good acting in a film. And uh, it was good to see him in this movie as well. As well as uh, Anna Chancellor as uh, the vice president or whatever. She was great. I've seen her in a question. Yeah, I've seen her in a couple of other things. She's... It was cool to see her in like a funny role because I've seen her in a lot of like 
you know, kind of stuffy, poncy, uh, British upper crust roles. So it was cool to see her doing something a little bit different in this. What, and what else was she in that I would know? Uh, my everybody Kev's thing is failing me right now. <laughs> we have a death, my everybody. Rain this morning. <laughs> yeah, we have a death. Everybody Kev's is closed for service. I didn't uh, take my <laughs> Rain Man pills this morning, so it didn't work out. So not not working out so good. I might just take that uh, uh, and like copy and paste it six times. So it's like two minutes of runtime. <laughs> do it. That'd be fantastic. You know, I would do it. I know you would. <laughs> Um, I didn't realize that Helen Mirren was the voice of uh, Deep Thought mm. until I just looked it up as we were starting the show. It, I don't know. It, it sounds different. It didn't. She didn't sound like her for some reason to me. So yeah, just a quick throwback to uh, Bill Nye. I absolutely loved him as the like aged Mick Jaggery rock star in Love Actually, and and uh, he was perfectly cast as Slardy Bartfast. Yeah, definitely. I liked that the angle they. I liked the angle he brought to the character. And I liked the way they presented him. I thought it was really good. Yeah. You mean Bill? Yes. Yes. Bill Nye. Not the science guy. (laughs) Uh, Sorry. Is that an ejection death, Kev? You know, no. You know what? Uh, <laughs> good try. No, I uh, I closed the cockpit. <laughs> so, um, no, I was just going to say. You closed the cockpit and pulled the handle so you hit the inside of the glass. No, I was just going to throw the – yeah, exactly. I, I had bonked my head on the uh, inside of the glass. Uh, Anna Chancellor was in – a, a a really sort of under the radar, but a really good um, Bill Murray and Alfred Molina movie called The Man Who Knew Too Little. I don't know if a lot of people saw that, but it was it was really funny. I don't remember it, but I recall it being really good. And she played a, a Ponzi sort of douchey Brit in that as well. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, yeah, that that's another movie that people should check out if they haven't. Anyway. Um, my big, well, I was going to leave this for the nuggets section, but I'm going to say it now. I c- could not figure out who played the voice of the ship and I-, I couldn't believe it when it was Tom Lennon. And we've talked about Tom Lennon before on this show. I can't remember why because my brain <laughs> is nugget. just not working today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Tom, Tom Lennon was just great as the voice of the ship, man. I, I, he's perfect. And when I found out that it was him, I was like, oh, right. Of course. <laughs> who else? Yeah, Eddie the ship's computer is definitely very funny. Okay, so my my favorite was and still is is Richard Griffiths who does the voice of Yeltz or Jeltz or whatever the Vogon the main Jeltz. Vogon. I just I can't. I absolutely love that character. Just the way he the way he portrayed it. The voice is just fantastic, man. It just cracks me up every single time. Some of his. Little, little, just teeny reactions uh, to various different things throughout are just absolutely perfect, man. And it was hysterical. And it's, he's probably my favorite character actually in the movie now. Currently, my favorite character. Yeah, there's not a day that uh, it's lunchtime and I stop and go, All right, everybody, that's one hour for lunch. (laughs) I'll have two today. (laughs) Nice. What was that other bit, the lunch bit? Time is. Oh, I'm butchering this. It's like time is an illusion. Lunchtime doubly so. Lunchtime doubly so. Yeah, <laughs> this is so perfect. <laughs> the Vogons really add so much to the uh, to the film. You know, the character design we discussed, but like mm. just the like Brazil esque filling out of forms. You know, tri- in triplicate kind of stuff, and just the just all of that. Yeah, it's just so perfect. Ultra bureaucracy. Yeah, the um. I saw a little uh, anecdote about the poetry, the Vogon poetry, where it was saying, you know, Vogon poetry is the third worst in the world or some, or in the universe or something like that. And first place was some, you know, quadruple barreled woman in, in, in England. It turns out that the original manuscript was like he, Douglas Adams mentioned a dude that he went to college with, a poet who really sucked, and the guy got really mad about it and complained, and so he, she changed the name to that lady's name. I thought it was kind of funny that he calls out <laughs> some guy. 
<laughs> That's pretty rough. Imagine listening to the BBC radio and hearing your own name as the worst poet, and you're actually a poet, and you went to school with a guy that he's like, "Fuck," <laughs> and it's not a and it's not a made up name. Yeah, it was super good. That's funny. That's a nice little. That's yeah, a nice little nugget, nice little, man. Like, yeah, it's, it's just a little knife twist <laughs> to your college roommate <laughs> who sucked at poetry. Mo, it's kind of like that guy. Um, who got his? Re- we were talking about the guy that got his revenge uh, writing the script. Oh to- yeah, yeah, for Total Recall, wrote wrote uh, Richter, yeah, wrote in the villain, yeah, Richter. I like that. It kind of makes me want to be more vindictive, so that when we create some random piece of media, we can just like throw people under the bus that we disliked from our pasts. Oh, we will. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, you're staking up the kitchen with your stupid lasagna. I just want a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I had that more of like that like kind of cheesy PBS pledge drive kind of thing in my head where it was like, you know, for two dollars. Here are some great ways to listen to this great podcast, but I'm not gonna <laughs> talk about that. Here's Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Thanks, Kevin. No. And here to talk about that is algorithm. While you're off in space traveling to the nearest ring gate. You could be donating to Everybody Dies Podcast. Yeah, exactly. And for a pledge of just one dollar, you'll get this wonderful nothing burger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyways, we wanted to we just wanted to chime in and ask that you guys if you guys like our show, please tell some friends about it. We're trying to trying to grow the show and make it more awesome for you guys. So we would love it if you could uh, to share us with a friend or jump onto iTunes and give us a rating or something because it helps. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good thing I know where my towel is because it has spilled my pangalactic gargle blaster all over the place. No, no. <laughs> Very funny. So moving away from the cast, let's talk about the sort of overarching plot story message of this property film. Because it's absurdist, but there is a message here that's good. And I don't know, for some reason, doing a rewatch last night, I, there's a lot of things that I either forgot about or missed when I originally watched this, the many times that I originally watched this um years ago. And I like movies like this that it I mean the whole story really I think pokes fun at the way we do stuff. And you know, and again, we've talked about this ad nauseum and a lot of the science fiction, well, pretty much everything we do is science fiction. But um, you know, in saying that science fiction mirrors humanity and it mirrors the human condition and what's going on and all that sort of thing. So um there's a lot of that in this movie that I think is great. Because I think we need to have that stuff pointed out to us because we're stupid. <laughs> yep. Agreed. There you have it, folks. Show's over. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> what do you think the uh, overarching message is? Just that? Just that it's like we need to poke fun at ourselves? Or was there a broader? No, we need to be nicer to mice. Clearly. Ah, right. Of course. Obviously. No, that's not it. I, I just think that the whole... You know, it's like the earth gets destroyed. I mean, I don't know. There's he, He's really poking fun at something that we talked about. I don't think it was last week where we, we kind of went dark towards the end of the episode and started talking about how arrogant we are as a race of people, species of people. Mm. Chad, Chad and I in particular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're just a bunch of monkeys jerking off is what I think what I said. Yeah, something like that. I was just saying how arrogant we are that we think we know so much that we really have no idea what's going on. And and that I I think the sort of one of the bigger picture things in this film is that because as we go through the story and we loop back around to the end, we find out that, you know, the two mice are the two little girls that originally posed the question to Deep Thought and that you know, they turn themselves into mice and Earth was the experiment slash the computer to come up with the ultimate question. And, you know, we were five minutes, they were five minutes from figuring out what the ultimate question was when the Earth got destroyed. I mean, there's a lot going on in that statement, you know, and us, 
it very much I think is him poking fun at the fact that we think that we're like sort of the end all be all. You know, it's like of course Earth is the place where they're going to come up with the ultimate question because human beings are so smart. It's like, yeah, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's meant to showcase how absolutely absurd we are. There you go. It's really sharply uh, explained with the dolphin stuff. I really enjoyed how the dolphin yeah. so long and thanks for all the fish is kind of the opening of the film because it's kind of really, really late in the in the book. And I love the, uh, you know, misconstruing them trying to warn us for like backflips and squeaks and stuff. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just so fantastic yeah. that, you know, we're not the first or the second most intelligent species. We're the third most intelligent species in the 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 dolphins the dolphins we think we're we're so intelligent because of all the cities we've built and the dol and the dolphins are dumb because they just play around all the time and they think that they're better for exactly the same reasons and it's just like a perfect way to just crystal clearly explain how utterly ridiculous we are yes and I agree completely Kev that it uh, it takes the dark place that we we were uh, discussing in I believe the Westworld episode and and makes us think about it in a lighthearted way and kind of be like you know what I'm not going to take myself so seriously and I'm going to go and enjoy my my friends or family or the world and just stop being such a dickhead and whatever so I I agree I think it's I hadn't thought of it as the broader kind of message I had just kind of maybe taken it at face value as something silly but it does make you think about you know our self-importance and how we probably are the third most intelligent species on the planet earth and it's kind of okay you know like <laughs> it is okay yeah it's definitely okay and I think that uh I well just to clarify like I didn't really think about this ever like I, I must have seen this movie 20 times and I I loved it every single time but I didn't think about that until I watched it last night, you know, and, and that really kind of hit me in the face last night. So that's it, just to clarify that, you know. No, it's, it's an interesting point. I mean, I've I've a, a little digression that may or may not remain in the show, but a little <laughs> a little digression that I recall is um, I mentioned I mentioned spending some time in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and a really interesting thing happened when I was there where I was encountering a lot of like blatant corruption and kind of government corruption and really messed up stuff and bribery and all kinds of stuff that that I hadn't really encountered before. And when I went back to the States, thinking like, oh, my God, this place is so messed up. When I was back in the States, um, you know, on a on a break, I realized that we do exactly the same thing. We just cover it up better, <laughs> you know. And so like you realized it was worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is worse. But like, I think we fool ourselves into thinking that we don't do that stuff because we pretend we don't or we hide it better or we lie to ourselves. And I feel like the, the comings and goings of the world in the last five years has shown everyone on Earth just how dumb we can be. And so it's no surprise that it's this recent viewing that's brought kind of the uh, the meta message to light. Because prior to that, we all thought we were hot shit. But now we're starting to realize that we're kind of not. <laughs> So I think it's a good point. No, yeah, thank you. And and on multiple levels too, because I think also to add to that kind of list that you just rattled off, that people are, you know, they're afraid to to they're afraid to admit it. And they're afraid to admit that it's real. It's like there's corruption going on like, you know, like every single country in the world. And yeah. when you you know, people go, Oh yeah, yeah, of course. And they go, Oh yeah, right, of course. But then, you know, when it comes down to something actually being in your face, then they're like, oh, whoa, no, you know, I don't, I, don't, I, I gotta go mow my lawn. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, or even corruption in their own household, you know, little small things. Like, oh, no, it's fine when I do it. But if my neighbors do it, then no way. <laughs> you know, exactly, like, man. Yeah. Exactly. It's super funny. It kind of, it kind of has a, it's kind of like a meta take on, how you know nobody actually gives a shit what you do and like so many of us are so hung up on what other people think but the reality is is that people just don't think about you, <laughs> you know, like you think everyone's thinking about you but they're not man they don't give a fuck you know they're not unless they're exceedingly bored yeah exactly <laughs> like we're so caught up in all these silly like mind games that we play that uh, it's 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 kind of fun to go on a Douglas Adams style silly ride to kind of remind us of just how silly we are. Totally, because you, you're right. People are people think everybody's like looking at them and thinking about them and all that, but the reality is that most people are too selfish to do that. They're thinking of themselves. Exactly. Yeah. But it was a uh, it was delightful to uh, revisit this and and uh, you know even just you know 
cleaning up my house today, listening to the audiobook and stuff. It's just it's just such a delightful creation. The guy is just hilarious. Yeah. The presentation of our absurd ridiculousness is it's just fantastic. I, I was gonna say second to none. I don't know if it's second to none. I don't know if it's the bar either, but it's definitely up there. And maybe maybe this just came to mind, but maybe the difference between this and a Mel Brooksy kind of film is that a lot of the Mel Brooksy style of films were taking the piss out of a genre, whereas this thing is just taking the piss out of us. Right. Out of everything. Yeah, right. It's like so it's not it's not a genre piss take, it's like a humanity piss take because we're more absurd than any genre piss take could possibly be. And I could see that being a major source of of love for for the material. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean the characters are archetypal that serve that that idea, like, you know, almost every single one represents a part of us in terms of one part of our stupidity. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah, and it kind of, it's interesting in a way because Trillion is not super fleshed out from the source material and there isn't any questular in the source material to my memory, but it's kind of interesting in a way because like Trillion's like the one non screw up in the room while a bunch of dudes just like fumble around and fucking everything up, which I kind of enjoy too. Because mm. it kind of it kind of marries somewhat with I don't know at least my perception of of you know the patriarchy. You know, <laughs> like we're all just fumbling around while all the ladies look at us and laugh and say, "You guys are a bunch of fucking jackasses," you know, and we're all trying yeah. to like hit on them, yeah. and you know, it's just. It kind of has another meta layer there too, which I kind of, I find very humorous. Oh, definitely. You mean like check out my big gun and check out my big truck and ch- check out my big spaceship? Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, that, that's kind of why uh, that's kind of why the Trillion Arthur Dent love angle in the film kind of resonates is because like it, it is a very obvious layer of the human condition that uh, is worth poking fun at. Absolutely, and I think he doesn't pass up any opportunities to throw in a ridiculous or, or point out a ridiculous thing that people do, man or woman, you know, because when they get the point of view gun, you know, and she's firing it at Zaphod, you know, she starts to get teary and says like, you know, that I've always picked these flashy guys, you know, missing the fact that what I really want is right in front of me or something to that effect, you know, and that's – something that so many people do man yeah i mean over you know you sort of talking about the overall the overarching you know theme of the book um and or of the story we'll just we'll just say the story so that we're referring to all the different incarnations of it but when i discovered this stuff um i feel like i was in a portion of my life where things weren't making a lot of sense to me i was you know done with school i was becoming an adult i was you know living on my own and you know life was interesting but things weren't making a lot of sense to me and so finding a story that was you know i I always kind of resonated with absurdist humor but finding Mm. a story that was you know absurdist humor on like a galactic scale (laughs) totally (laughs) And, you know, approaching the absurdism from sort of a philosophical point of view was great. And, you know, what I always took away from those books is it's plastered right on the cover. You know, it's it's just relax, man. Nobody has all the answers. Just let life take you. Don't panic. Yeah, that's perfect. That was always sort of what I took from, you know, like, fuck it, man. Just have a laugh and, you know, try not to worry about shit so much. (laughs) It's not going to help anything. We're all just as dumb as each other. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's all it's all ridiculous. It's fucking stupid. <laughs> Laugh at it. Laugh at it instead of being afraid of it, you know? And and that was mm. that was how I sort of that was what I got out of it anyways. Yeah. That's uh it reminds me of something I heard recently where Michelle Obama was being interviewed and the interviewer was saying to her, What's it like being in the room with all of these, you know, world leaders and you know, all of these power brokers and stuff and her her response, like not a direct quote, but her response was basically like, the thing I realized is they're not very smart. And I thought it was really, it was just like right on, man. (laughs) You know, cause like the amount of times that you're, oh, I wonder what it's like sitting in the office with the bosses making all the decisions at this company. And when you actually get to a leadership position, you're like, no one knows what they're fucking doing. We're all just a bunch of people that have no idea and we're doing the best we can and we're making it up as we go along. And 
her comment that right, yeah. even at the highest levels, it's just a bunch of knuckleheads doing their best. It's just, it's perfect. It's definitely a dope panic. Layer after layer of fake it till you make it, you know? Yeah, exactly. All the way to the top. There's a, there's a really great line from the movie, as Sardi Bartfuss says, and it's uh, perhaps I'm old and tired, but I think the chances of finding out what's actually going on are so absurdly remote that the only thing to do is say, hang the sense of it and keep yourself busy. <laughs> I'd much rather be happy than right any day. Yeah, it's perfect. It's like so, it's like so zen, too. It's just like, don't worry about it. Just, you know, find your moment of zen and just chill the fuck out. Where to? We talked about kind of the opening a little bit. We talked about the Vogon shippy stuff a little bit. So do we want to talk about like our favorite little bits or moments and maybe chat about some of the uh, interesting scenes? Yeah, go for it, man. Okay, yeah, cool. You know, uh, when Ford and Arthur get, get picked up by the Heart of Gold, you know, it's coming back to normalcy from the improbability drive. Yes. And they're both couches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. They're both sofas. Like, I love that. Ford, I think I'm a sofa. <laughs> I know how you feel. Like, <laughs> Great. You know, like just a little short thing to illustrate a concept in the in the movie and the story at large, and it, it works perfectly. It immediately makes it crystal clear that confusing things happen with this ship. I'm a, I'm a sh- kind of ashamed to say this, and I'm essentially falling on my sword here, but I didn't realize until watching this the other day that the improbability drive that you use as your ratings was based on the Hitchhiker's Guide improbability drive. I just kind of, like, left it. Oh, my God, dude. So I'm, full, I'm so thoroughly dead, and I'm okay with it, but uh, I just wanted to say that out loud. You are dead. Hey, that's okay. It's okay, man. Yeah, and on that uh, improbability drive, I loved the. I remember very much in the theater watching this, like loving the yarn, the spool of yarn, sock puppety dude puking yarn into a bucket improbability. That was just so awesome. <laughs> right, they 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 come back into normalcy and they're all like, yeah, sock puppets, whatever. <laughs> it's great. It's just so good, man. Yeah. I, I think, you know, my bitchiness aside, when I watched this originally, that was just, like, so delightful. Yeah. The um the idea of the improbability drive was interesting, where I saw a little bit where Douglas Adams, it'll come as no surprise, made the entire thing up as he went along. And he, he, he found himself painted into a corner with the guys being outside of, kicked out of the Vogon ship and in space with no spacesuits. And he was saying it was so improbable that they would be picked up that the only plausible thing was to come up with an implausibility drive because there's wow. nothing else that could be done that would have been even remotely plausible as to uh, how they could have gotten out of I it. I really like that. I like that a lot. So I could just picture the dude sitting down at his typewriter with a cup of tea and, you know, just being like, fuck, what am I going to do here? <laughs> I just think it's the perfect way to give birth to an awesome concept. Definitely. Yeah, the story is great at throwing in these surprising, you know, solutions to the plot hangups, you know, or places that they end up like, how the hell is, you know, how's this going to pan out? And it just, it always, it never uh, disappoints yeah. <laughs> in what he comes up with. It kind of has that like comedian joke formula where it's like set up and then like the twist is the punchline is what's least expected. Like he, they, he just twists it in such an amazingly funny way most of the times so that it just makes it kind of elevates every joke. There's like a joke a minute and they're all just so out of left field. Probably like you said, Kev, because it's British humor versus our American upbringings. Like it's part of what I love about mm. Python is it, it was so different that it just like broke my brain half the time. And that's what I was delighted by. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with that. Speaking of which, yep. I think you mentioned the Quantum Thief recently, the John LaFlambeur books. Yep. Yeah. I picked that back up after you said it and I just finished it like two nights ago. My God, that was fucking fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> it's like Wow. Speaking of break your fucking brain, dude, that is utterly fucking amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great writer, Hanu Rayanami. He's he's really good. Mm, I just started the second book last night. There, you know, I People say the second one is kind of a lull, and then the third one, like, really picks it back up. But they're all good. It's all part of the same story. He was actually going to make it all one book. Oh, really? And one of his writer friends, like, yeah, one of his writer friends was like, no, you can't do that, dude. It's too much. You just break them up into parts, and then, you know. Oh, that makes more sense as to why it was shorter and stuff. Yeah. People say the same thing about the original Dune trilogy, with the second book being a lull. It's, I really enjoyed it. But anyways, digression aside, I appreciate the... Uh, the recommendation and it very much fits with the uh, brain breakiness of uh, Python and uh, Douglas Adams and devs, yeah, and devs, yeah, yes. What's the name of that book? The Quantum Thief. Mm. Sounds cool, it's exactly what I needed. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. 
There's lots of and and the dude is uh, Hanu Rainimi is Finnish. Oh, okay. And there's lots of like cool, like interesting, like background Finnish folklore sort of stuff weaved in in a oh. in like with like an updated idea. It's cool. Mm. Mm. You wouldn't necessarily notice it, but there are parts in the book where you're like, oh, that's kind of an interesting concept, and then you find out it's like, oh, that comes from like Finnish folklore. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but they just turned he just turned it into sci-fi kind of a thing. right. Kind of in a <sighs> weird way has a kind of a witcher vibe in the sense that some of the stuff you encounter of slavic folklore you just didn't know about before yeah that's interesting so scenes you guys you got you want me to keep going or you guys got anything or yeah you you go you go all right cool um a simple scene but one that i love just because of the 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 energy of the scene and all the crazy creatures that are in it is when they're in queue at the vogon like you know bureaucracy center or whatever and they're trying to get they're trying to get show released and like it's just like that whole scene is just ridiculous. <laughs> it's so great. The creatures are so great. And uh, you know, it's like them having to like keep going back for different forms. And one of the creatures that's in line is actually the original the T V series version of Marvin the Robot. Oh, really? Yeah. So there's just lots of neat little stuff that happen in that. And it's- oh, you mean that super robotic character? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kev. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The robot that's in line. That's the original Marvin. <laughs> that's a death cab. Come on. Wow. That was, I think we have, we have a death and easily the dumbest thing I've ever said on the show. <laughs> hey, you mean the robot in the line? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. That one. I, I got to say this, man. This, this, this was an epic stupidity on my part, unrelated to anything. I'm going to say it anyway. I was eating sushi with a friend and I was like, man, these are fantastic. What are these little tuna roll things? And she goes, uh, <laughs> Tuna rolls. <laughs> I love it when that happens, man. Every once in a while, you just we all do it. It happens to the best of us, man. Yeah. That's um, yeah, yeah. That's bureaucracy scene really reminded me a lot of Brazil, which is another fantastic movie. Yeah, it just reminded me in general of like <laughs> just going to the RMV, you know? Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god, man. Total DMV, definitely. I hate the RMV. Oh, uh, it's everybody, bad, everybody man. Does. It's yeah. just it's I'm pretty sure people that go to hell if if you if you died and you've gone to hell you come back and you're behind the desk at the <laughs> RMV. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. And you're just there for eternity. I just remember the ladies that worked at the uh the DMV on island and just how miserable they seemed to be all the time. It's just like, oh, they were tough, yeah. man. They, were, they tough. were very tough. Tough cookies. You were always you were always in fear of being blacklisted in some way mm. when you went there. I think that's the thing about those those places like that, bureaucratic places like that. You know, it's like the people are miserable, and if you say one wrong thing, you are going to be fetching forms all day. You're going to be at the back of the line ten times. Like, it is going to suck. I feel like those those particular people have this like quantum field around them that make you say two in a roll shit over and over. Like they look at you like everything out of your mouth <laughs> is like, what is this little tuna roll? <laughs> they just, they think you're the dumbest human that's ever been fucking born. <laughs> right. You just feel like so small when you stand in front of those people. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine they get so many stupid questions that everything just starts to sound like a stupid question to them. Like, like every person that walks in, they're just like, "Oh, look at this dumbass, look at this, look at this fucking butt. idiot!" Like, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. My, um, I always have a chat with uh, my lovely lady lumps about people like that. Where we, we always joke about it in the supermarket. You go into the supermarket, and you're like, "Hey, where's the?" Uh, macaroni and cheese and they're like fucking aisle seven idiot and you're like i've never been here before dude like i'm sorry (laughs) i feel like it's that kind of thing where they've seen everything and they know what they know and like just you're new to the scene but they're more than happy to think you're the biggest piece of shit in the world because you haven't memorized the store like they have you know like uh Mm. it perfectly captured that that happens in Australia. It happens everywhere, man. I feel. I feel, I feel like well, it's I don't. So- I didn't. I'm asking because I don't know. I mean, I know it happens in the U.S., but I, I didn't realize it dickheads like I that. I feel like it touches. The- I feel like it kind of touches on that human condition thing that we talked about before, where like, cool, you've memorized the grocery store. Doesn't make you better than me, dude. <laughs> and it doesn't make me better than you. Can you just point me to the macaroni and cheese, please? And we'll have a laugh, and I'll say, good day, sir, and I'll tip my fedora, you know? <laughs> like, 
it's just it, i think like maybe just circling back like the vogon bureaucracy is just like the perfect encapsulation of of like the ridiculousness of humanity and and how just because you get a a, a form approval it's okay to blow up a planet like it's just it's fantastic yeah the other scene i was going to mention was uh you know when they land on vogue sphere and they're like walking along the beach, heading to the city. And every time somebody has an idea, they get smacked in the face. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> I just love that part. <laughs> and then the the uh, the lemon helmet. Yes, the thinking cap. I fucking love the lemon helmet. Yeah, the the thinking cap. What was that again? The thinking cap. Um, after Hama Kavula takes uh, Zephod's second head hostage, and Zephod's kind of like you know dumber in shock, and like he's yeah he's a little dumber, and he's like Ugh, he's like all groggy and stuff. Ford puts the helmet on him with like the lemon zester on top of it. <laughs> every time, every time, uh, <laughs> every time Zephod is like getting distracted or or you know whatever, like he he grinds up the lemon on top of his head and it like gives him zest, and he kind of comes snaps back into it. <laughs> I forgot about that. Gives him about 10 minutes worth of thinking power. Yes, that is what they say. Yeah. But that is not something that was in the book that was like a great addition. Yeah, a great example of uh, something that's even better than the books. Um, the uh, the the bejeweled crab thing really kind of re- made me, uh, oh, God damn it, again with Star Wars going to kill me. But the uh, it really reminded me of the Jabba grabbing stuff out of his bowl and eating it. You're dead. Yeah, I'm dead. You know what I mean, though. Like it, it definitely had that throwback to Jabba pulling something out of the pit and eating it, and instead of being entertained by dancers, uh, they're being entertained by paperwork, which is it's quite funny. Are you refer- are you referring to Jelts pulling the bejeweled crab out of that container? Yeah, exactly. When he's about to read poetry and smashing it with his blurgle crunching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> with his vertical meat tenderizer. Yeah, that was great. What happens after that whole Vogon planet stuff? What's what's next? I can't recall. They go to Magrathia, right? Yes. M- no, sorry, Magrathia. Magrathia. Yeah. <laughs> Magrathia. Yeah. I, I love Zaphod's just, you know, every time. <laughs> every time Magrathia is mentioned or shows up, he's just like, Magrathia! <laughs> Magrathia! <laughs> <laughs> I know he flips uh, out like a like a kid in a candy store. It's funny, uh, a funny yeah. addition to the to the whole story. Yeah. Speaking of the beach scene, like that's like he's going on about Magrathia, and Ford's like, "No, we're on Vogue Sphere. No." <laughs> <laughs> it's like Magrathia. It's Magrathia. I know it is. <laughs> well, it's the same thing when they land on Vitvoodle Six or whatever where Hama lives. Hmm. Oh, you know what? That's that's one that that I uh, like the Jatrafarded people and the the great green Arkel seizure. That whole thing is is touched on in the story, but like that's another cool thing, interesting thing they decided to like illustrate in the movie. Is that none of that actually happened? You know, like they don't actually go there. I think in the books, um, but they sort of used that in the in the movie, and I thought it was really really great. I love the whole like <laughs> the whole scene where they go into the church. And uh, Hamakavul is giving his sermon or whatever, and like you know, they're like, <laughs> instead of saying "Amen," they say "Achoo," like all that <laughs> stuff. Like, I just oh, that was great. So dumb. It's so good. So yeah, totally dumb, but but just perfect. You know, seeing it, yeah, seeing it in action is is something else. Yeah, I agree completely. The the um the Magrathia stuff and the you know meaning of life, the amazing forty two, which this episode is episode forty two. I'm I'm pleased to announce. Um, I really love that whole meaning of life is solved with a ridiculous thing, but not only that, but the meaning of life has nothing to do with humans being awesome. Like you said, Kev, it's got everything to do with humans being like a chip of RAM in the computer. <laughs> it's just, it's yeah, a, it's such a funny, it's such a funny uh, element of the story. Well, also too, how, you know, they came up with the answer first, right? Like they were like, no, 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 we can't be bothered. Cause that's such you know, very human, very American thing to do. You know, it's like, well, what's the answer? No, 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 I'm not interested in the details. Just give me the answer. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like. Well, I, don't, I don't need to know the question. Right, right, right. Exactly. So here's the answer. It's 42. <laughs> well, what does that mean? I don't know. You never gave me a question. It's like pretty much sums it up right there. Yeah. <laughs> it sums up the human condition. And then they go back to visit and the supercomputer's just like watching cartoons. <laughs> well, you know, I mean. <laughs> 
the, the more we the more we learn and the more we explore and the more we find out about the universe, it's quite likely that, you know, <laughs> the deeper we dive, the more unrelated to us the answer to everything is going to be. Yeah. You know, like we're just gonna run up against a, a wall of brute fact that, you know, there's no deeper meaning, man. That's just what it is. So <laughs> you know. Do with it what you may. Put a giant statue of your dead daughter outside the campus and uh create a hover cube. Yes. Wait, what what about I think you you broke Kevin, I think. I think I feel like Kev's broken. <laughs> uh, what what'd you say about the hover cube? Were you talking about devs? Yeah. Yeah. Hang on, I'm definitely not looking at the internet. Oh, we have an ejection death, ladies and gentlemen. What are you looking up? I love how you get so bored of your own show that you leave. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, this is all right, but fucking, whoa, what's this? <laughs> what actor can I learn their filmography about? I was actually looking up. Uh, Still looking. Hang on. I was looking up uh, what else Ian Griffiths had done. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard Griffiths, who did uh, the voice of Jeltz. Very topical. <laughs> Still going back there. <laughs> it's like Just had an open tab that you just dove into. Oh, it gets better than that. And no, that, that I had it on IMDb. He was the Uncle Vernon in Harry Potter, the muggle family dad that Harry Potter lived with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And was that worth derailing the entire episode for, Kev? Uh, no. Uh, what was uh, worth it was I caught an, an item while I was looking at that. <laughs> It was the best sci-fi movies on Netflix right now. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a dick, man. Uh, I know, man. Ooh, really shiny. Excited. Yeah, exactly. Shiny. You really are all over the fucking place. You, you you need to put some zest in your fucking lemon helmet, dude, and get back to the goddamn show. We need, we need to put the thinking cap on, Kev. Are you ready, buddy? Here we go. I'm grinding it. <laughs> you got to scream Magrathea. Exactly what I need is that lemon thinking cap, man, because I am off my game today. I'm really sorry. That's all right. I think I, I think I need it myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also don't, um, you know, I haven't read all the books and, like, done all that. So, you know, I don't know. I don't even know why. I, I have no idea why I just said that. <laughs> it's no bearing to my current <laughs> state. <laughs> I have no idea why you said the last four or five things that you said, but here we are. Well, there you go, Chad. <laughs> that further supports that I am just a pile of gooey mush. So the universe is deterministic. Yeah. The, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> nice. That's a, that's a meta show tie-in. Kevin has just looked inward and discovered that he has no idea why he just said what he said. <laughs> wow. That just exploded my brain. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, you know, just sort of kind of condense all that. Uh, yeah. I did not hear anything you just said. <laughs> no idea where we are. Good segue. Okay. Good segue. Well, we were talking about scenes. So you guys got anything? I think the um, – what's the gun? The point of view gun? Yep. The point of view gun, yes. Yeah. I think the point of view gun, well, completely ridiculous in a way because of just how convenient it is. Like, it's interesting. I, I thought that scene with – Trillian shooting it and then being like, that oh, doesn't affect me. I'm a woman, you know, like it's silly and kind of dumb and kind of funny and kind of not funny, but it's an interesting addition, especially considering that it's like the ultimate way that Marvin saves the day at the end, which is a simplification of a similar result in the uh, source material. So I'm just curious, like if you guys had any thoughts on the point of view thing. That's good. Um, uh, That's one of the things I was going to mention was Marvin <laughs> using the point of view gun and a bunch of, you know, it's, it's all the Vogons, but it's like they, I feel like, you know, everybody's attitude towards Marvin is like, oh, he's just a robot. You know, like, why Why are you so, de you know, it's annoying that he has this depressed personality because he's just a robot. But really, you know, Marvin is actually feeling it, right? It's not just a, it's not just like a thing that's programmed in, into him. He really is filled with dread at everything. So it, it's fun to see that illustrated by, by him shooting the Vogon army and, and all of them just falling down immediately with the president. Being like, oh, <laughs> I can't yeah. go on. Oh. <laughs> so I thought, I thought it was cool of them to do that because Marvin is definitely a character that I think gets overlooked and, you know, could use a bit of humanizing or, you know, we need to have a little bit of empathy for, for Marvin. 
Yeah, the poor bastard, for sure. Absolutely, man. It's similar to like a Trillian and a and a um, Arthur. He has more kind of going for him in terms of character development and stuff, but um, being able to to utilize him as much as they did in the in the film with Warwick Davis and um, what's his name Rickman Alan Rickman Alan Rickman was just like it's just great to to have someone like an Alan Rickman and a Warwick Davis teamed up because they just you can rely on them to just deliver some great stuff. And as a counterpoint to the friendly doors, like Marvin is just such a fantastic, uh, fantastic element. No question. I, I thought it was interesting. The difference in the climax of the, of the book where it was like two cops that come down and start shooting things up and then they spontaneously die. And you end up finding out that Marvin's up talking to their ship and bores their ship into suicide. So it's like a very similar outcome. <laughs> But, yeah. <laughs> but like it would have been really, really challenging to make that happen in, on screen. But, you know, it's just <laughs> the fucking ship is so miserable talking to Marvin that it just blows itself up, which kills its, uh, its you know, space suited cops down on land. Like, it's just ridiculous, but so fantastic. Yeah. There's, I mean, in the story at large, there's just so many great things that happen with Marvin. Like, you know, when they're at the uh, this doesn't this is all outside of the movie, but we may as well while we're talking about Marvin. Uh, they're at the headquarters for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it comes under attack. And Marvin like tricks an attack tank into into like basically killing itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's just like, oh, I don't have any weapons at all, and the tank's like, really. They send you into battle without any weapons? I mean, I have this thing and I have that. It gets him like all fired up and angry at like, you know, people mistreating robots. It's an outrage. And he killed himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It's funny that we're outside of the movie a little bit because I remembered, I remembered the like first book or whatever, or I remember the story being a lot more of a combination of, of the first few books. Yeah. And so, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if some of my grumpiness about the movie was that I, I had thought there was a lot more to it. But it turns out that it's like it's a pretty good encapsulation of the arc of the first book. And I was painting my apartment in San Francisco when I was listening to these books, the second and third books for the first time. And I kind of have blended them all together into one larger story. So, yeah, I think uh, I think it might be like you said, like there's a lot of stuff outside of the film that uh, is just hilarious. And the restaurant at the end of the universe, like it's kind of a shame that they never got around to making more because it didn't do so well because that was I, I was really entertained by that one too yeah man i i would love to see a you know as much as i love the movie and i think they did a good job with the amount of time they had and trying to compress things in and not make it too jankety you know like they, they kept it together nicely and for what it is i love the movie but i, I would love to see like a, a mini series mm. based on these books um that takes all the time it needs to go through all of this stuff it would be great it would be and i mean you you could almost make an argument for like avoiding the Spider-Man reboot itis where like instead of making the first book first as a series start with the restaurant at the end of the universe maybe pick up where the movie left off and then if if it if it mm. works great and circle back and do the first se- I don't know you know it's kind of like how we do I like sh- that it's kind of like how we do some of these shows where like you know, instead of starting with the first movie, we're going to start with the second one. You know, like Riddick. We did uh, Chronicles of Riddick instead of Pitch Black. Like, it would be interesting for a show to tackle that. Maybe this isn't the best material to do it, but... Are you referring to time jumping? <laughs> nah, I don't know if I am. <laughs> I guess what I'm referring to is, like, I don't know of any media that's, like, taken from one form and then been like okay we're going to take from this form and we're going to run with it in this other form so they're going to take the movie and run with it in tv form you know i don't know does that make sense yeah i, I mean i was thinking just more like a, a, a i mean i know everybody hates reboot itis but you know um I was just thinking of a fresh take done, you know, something more akin to what the original BBC TV series was, but, you know, done with like everything we have now. Yeah, yeah. No, you take so you sort of take the best of all the ideas, right? So you got the film, which was great, and then you got the, you know, the BBC series, even the radio play, and then you, you take it and, you know, you do it now where you can do exactly that. Take the best parts of all of them, combine them together put some, you know, more money at it 
and t- you know, take its time with a series. I think that's a great way to do it. I actually like Chad's idea really a lot too. So start with restaurant at the end of the universe, then go through the rest of the books. And then if, you know, they're successful, then, you know, redo Hitchhikers. It would be interesting. Even if Hitchhikers isn't what, isn't the first time that that happens with media, I'd be, I'd be curious for some form of media to take from a, a previous incarnation and just running with it instead of, instead of the thing that we've talked about a lot in the superhero space of like, yep, got the origin story, heard, seen this 17 times and you just get right to the, the next bit, you know, might not be the best, the best piece for that, but I'd be curious to see someone try that. Yeah. Um, and I guess like on what you were saying, Ben, like I agree and I'd like to see it more like an expanse where it's like they do a season per year or whatever, or per 18 months instead of like a Lord of the Rings where they film them all at once. I kind of feel like a filling, filming it all at once thing worked for Lord of the Rings in the sense of making it a financial success, but I think it worked against the Lord of the Rings in the sense that they didn't have a lot of time to breathe and develop, you know, yeah. something that elevated the material, I guess. It's a tough, it's a tough one. Like, I'm, a, I'm not a huge fan of the Lord of the Rings movies, but at the same time, like, as an accomplishment of teamwork, like, fuck me, that was a lot of work that they put in, you know, and yeah, but and whatnot, but... I feel like the new format of media where Expanse has plenty of time and multiple years for everyone to gel and, you know, I don't know. I feel like it has its advantages in something as complicated as something like uh, Hitchhikers. Yeah, there is a – this isn't necessarily related. It sort of is though. And it is towel day after all. I recently discovered that uh, BBC America made a series based on Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, which is uh, really? another series by Douglas Adams. And apparently it, it, it didn't work out. It only had two seasons. But I watched the first season. And uh, it's not like it's based on the characters, but it's not like a retelling of the books. Mm. So I thought that was an interesting way to approach it. And uh, I found it to be quite enjoyable. Yeah, I'll check it out sometime. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't either. <laughs> I literally just found it on uh, just found it on Hulu this week. Oh, really? You watched it that recently? And have you read the books? I've never really read the books. Yes. Yeah. Right. Are they good? Yeah. Yeah. If you like Douglas Adams, they're definitely they're definitely all him, man. <laughs> it's that same kind of humor. I love it. Guys, I think we've picked all the meat off of this bone. Why don't we do uh, the NDR? Let's do the nuggets, the deaths, and the ratings, and um, free our audience from us. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly from me. So I saw I saw that Douglas Adams was kind of like in a Marvin headspace while hitchhiking from London to Istanbul. And so he was like drunkenly stargazing in a field in Austria in the early 70s. And he was hitchhiking with a stolen copy of a book called Hitchhiker's Guide to Europe. And he later wrote to the author of that book and say that said that he got super depressed in Austria and then the stars came out. He thought someone ought to write a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because it took a lot. It looked a lot more attractive out there than it did around me. So I thought it was really interesting that he was kind of like bummed out Marvin hitchhiking and came up with it via like a, a bout of mild depression. It was just it was an interesting origin story. I like that a lot. No, that's a good nugget, Chad. Thanks, Benny. You got one? Yeah, I have a couple. Uh, one is one is definitely a nugget. The other one is sort of like a personal story related to the to the overarching story sweet i guess i'll i guess i'll start with that one um jesus in 2000 like right before i moved from connecticut out to nantucket i was staying with a buddy of mine in his apartment like sort of temporarily right before i left and it was like you know early spring it was kind of a warm day so i wanted to open the the window but like it was one of those like old school windows that just doesn't fucking stay up by itself (laughs) So the first thing I saw when I needed to keep the window open was my leather bound edition of, you know, all the books of the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> so I used it to hold the window open. I left for a while when it came back. I went to shut the window and the, the book fell out. And it was kind of like a weird apartment complex. And I had to, the only way to we were on the second floor and the only way to get down to the first floor was sort of like a convoluted way. So I looked, I saw the book down there, went out and around to where the window was, and the book was just like gone. There was nobody around, nothing going on. The book had just (laughs) completely disappeared. So I just thought, I was like, at the moment, I was like, well, 
It sucks that I lost it, but that is the most hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy way to lose a copy <laughs> of the book that you ever could. You know, it's like the improbability drive fired off while I was going down there and it just turned into like one of the plants or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I like it. That's great. And then um, while, uh, you know, researching this past week, I found a pretty funny story. Um, when Douglas Adams was writing the story for the BBC radio play, um, he had an idea for Sardi Bartfest that he wanted the name to be the most, you know, rude and obscene thing possible. So he started off with farty fuckballs. <laughs> <laughs> Spelled like P H A R T I P H U K B O R L Z. Oh my god! And sent the and then just sort of had a back and forth with the BBC, like you know, sending them new ideas that, until he finally came to Sardi Bartfist, which they accepted. <laughs> wow, I can't believe that's where he went first. Yeah, uh, I would have well, loved was, to have seen that email exchange uh, or like exchange of letters. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to sir. see all the other candidates, you know, like all, like what he, what he went what the next one was, you know. Dear sir, I humbly propose a slarty bard fast. <laughs> That's fucking funny. I've been a fly on the wall for that conversation. I've got a uh, do you got any nuggets, Kev? I got a closing nugget. You know what? I have no nuggets today. I had a, my nugget was Tom Lennon. I already talked about it. That's cool. I, I, cl- I have a, a bit of a closing nugget that relates to the show just in that um Douglas Adams originally conceived of a series called The Ends of the Earth, which was meant to be every episode being a different way that the Earth is destroyed. And the first episode was the Earth being just demolished by a hyperspace bypass. And he loved that story so much that he developed it. But I really enjoy how his original idea was essentially in this episode, Every Earth Dies. And um, we've uh, nice. we've carried on the tradition. And I thought it was really funny and tied into the show. Excellent. I love that. Excellent. Excellent. That is fantastic. Uh, deaths? deaths. Do we do ratings or deaths? Deaths, then ratings. Okay. Deaths. Okay. Here we go. Would the Crypt Keeper be so kind as to tell us how we all died? The Crypt Keeper. Firstly, I died when I couldn't remember some actor's name in the beginning of the show, but really that happened about five times in the show, probably more than that even. So I died a lot. You're dead. Yep. Chad uh, died because he didn't realize until we did this episode that Ben's improbability-driven rating system was derived from, inspired from this film. Yeah, that's pretty lame. And then a Star Wars death. Yes, a Star Wars death. And my other death was, aside from the other 10 deaths I had with my sort of stupidity and general apathy, was probably one of the dumbest things I've ever said in my life, <laughs> which now, which Chad turned into like an actual thing, uh, a tuna roll thing is when I said, um, oh, you mean the, the, the robot guy yep. <laughs> in the, in the, in the uh, I can't, I'm so stupid. I can't even remember what the name of that room was. Anyway, do you have any Ben related deaths? No, Benny didn't die. I I did die, but I think it's probably oh. going to get edited out. <laughs> yeah. So Ben Ben died off camera this week, folks. Just yeah. be just be assur- rest assured, he is dead. Okay, he died. I don't remember what it was either. I was stammering or something like I yeah, couldn't I don't know. Oh, I was gonna. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it was exactly like that. <laughs> that was pretty much it. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Exactly. That was it. That's what it sounded like. So there you go. I like it. We'll take it as a death. Oh, you had an ejection death too, Kev. Oh, nice. It's always a good death. Oh, I had an ejection death as well when I was uh, looking at that uh, article about (laughs) the best sci-fi movies on Netflix. (laughs) So there you go. God, this is like some kind of record for me. I had like 15 deaths in this show. Yeah. In this episode, everybody dies, especially Kev. Yeah, it's almost as many people as that die. It's... Oh my god! You're dead I again. Even speak. Stop wow. fucking speaking. Ratings. Just shut your mouth. <laughs> Just ratings. Shut the fuck up. I'm gonna keep my rating short because uh, I can't speak. Uh, I give this movie an A. <laughs> Sorry, a nine. And he's dead again because it's numbers. <laughs> this movie gets a nine point five from me. I love it. <laughs> next, next show member, go. Um, the algorithm's fucked, and I hate it, and I'm starting to get grumpy about it, but. <laughs> 
it's really challenging because some of the like fives out of ten are good, sixes out of tens are really good, and this ends up at a five point five based on the other movies in the neighborhood. But I, I really, I don't know. I kind of feel like this is really good, even though it doesn't quite get there. But the neighborhood that it's in is like Blazing Saddles, Real Genius, Spies Like Us, so it's in really good company. But uh, yeah, maybe it's just that. Uh, comedies generally speaking don't get as high a number as uh non-comedies for me because i'm such an intellectual fucking super genius well at least you know that so maybe that's why the algorithm's fucked hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think it's a perfect encapsulation of uh the navel gazy we think we're hot shit humanity conversation we had earlier is that I think I'm such hot shit that I've got an algorithm that tells me that this movie is a 5.5. So the 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 key takeaway here is that I'm full of shit, ladies and gentlemen, and it and it took me 57 episodes slash 42 episodes to figure it out, but y'all figured it out way back in the day, I think. There you go. Yes, sir. What do you got, Higgs? Yeah, uh, 42 out of 45. Of course. Fuck yes, dude. Yes, I was dying to hear what you were gonna say. How couldn't it be? So good. I was actually thinking about that yesterday, and I was like, well, he can't use the improbability drive because that's in the movie. Like, that would cancel it out because it's in the movie. So yes. what is he going to do? He's going to have to use some sort of regular rating system that's going to blow our minds and blow my mind you just did. Yeah, I, I was just going to go with a normal rating and then I was like, oh, maybe I could figure out some way to employ beach dramatics, which is another way that uh, – <laughs> which is a later <clears throat> uh, star drive that is used in the series. But uh, that was just – that would have just been too complicated. Um, so, yeah. And what's the significance of the 45? There is none. It's just it, – the significance is about 42 and, you know, it, it wasn't a 42 out of 42. It was a 42 out of something else, so – Right, you're so it's essentially like a nine point three or a nine point five. Like right, he, yeah. he like you, you forty two is where you're starting, right? But if so you, it's like if you wanted to, and I'm not I'm not strong arming, but if you wanted oh to, boy. you could make it a forty two out of fifty seven, which is the exact number of episodes out of the exact number of episodes that we have. But oh, that might be bullying a bit. No, that would have been kind of cool too. But I like the way he did it. I would have done the same thing. So mm. he's let's so let's just say he if he rated it. Uh, five out of ten using that scale as a base, but he was going to use forty two as the number. Then it would be forty two out of seventy or a hundred, yeah, yeah, yeah. or you know what I mean. Like, yeah. but forty two out of forty five totally, is like I get exactly why he did it that way. I like it. Uh, I love that I've spurned a you know a uh, both of you guys trying to figure out exactly <laughs> how my rating is working. It's great. This is, Very, we'll, we'll make a Facebook group about it. It'll be like a conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theory kind of thing. There's a I'm deeper like, like, hidden de- message I feel like, <laughs> into all of this. I know, and I feel like I'm trying to like I'm defending how awesome Ben is with his 42. <laughs> Ulan Kalu- Kalu- like, wait, no. Ulan no. Kalufid has written a book about my my 42 out of 45 rating. Yeah, right there after you, go, uh, you know the universe and some more of God's greatest mistakes. <laughs> 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 nice one. All right, so we got uh, our solid ratings, and then uh, what are we talking about next week, Algorithm? Good question. Because Hitchhiker's Guide is a special episode being released on Towel Day, it's outside of our normal schedule. The next episode will be over the top. Well, there you have it, folks. So stay tuned for the Sylvester Stallone super weird, kind of a classic. S- sweat extravaganza Over the top. It's about arm wrestling. Anyway, uh, I would like to apologize to the folks at home. I was totally off my game today. Uh, I still enjoyed doing this episode, and I definitely enjoyed this movie, and I loved watching it again. So thanks for joining us for this particular journey. Until next time. Happy Towel Day, everybody. See ya. Happy Towel Day. Happy Towel Day. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in. You can find the show notes for today's episode in your podcast, Abbo Choice. Or at our website, ebd.fm forward slash episodes forward slash 42. You can find me at Mulverine on Twitter, Ben at Jarhigo on Twitter, and Chad at Chad Normal on Twitter. You can ask us questions using the Twitter hashtag AskEBD. You can also contact us on Instagram, 
at EBD Podcast. Also Facebook, EBD Podcast. And our email is contact at ebd.fm. Anyway, folks, as we always say, thank you so much for tuning in and supporting the show. We really appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Take care.